The Elixir Sulfonilamide Incident, presented by Doug Ferguson, Andrew Rolsma, and Greg Simmons. Recorded on December 8, 2009, on Michigan State's campus. The sulfonilamide chemical is an antibacterial that became one of the first widely used drugs to treat streptococcal bacterial infections. It was most widely used in a powder and tablet form. However, as the drug's popularity grew, so did a demand for the drug to be developed into a liquid form. This is in fact where the toxic incident originated. Harold Cole Watkins, a chief chemist of the Massengill Company, introduced the idea of using diethylene glycol to dissolve the sulfonilamide into a liquid form. While this solution, in fact, liquidized the sulfonilamide, it also had turned the drug toxic. Diethylene glycol, also known as antifreeze, was known to be toxic to humans at this time. However, Harold Watkins was unaware of this. Without knowing these fatal details and there being little regulation of the new liquid form of the sulfonilamide, the poisoning began to spread as the new elixir form was distributed. Altogether, there were about 1,300 bottles of the contaminated medicine shipped in, in September of 1937. Sulfa drugs had been prescribed by many doctors to their patients for the last few years. So when a new and easier method of dosing became available, many doctors jumped at the chance to buy the new liquid form. The doctors initially were pleased with the drug, as they stated things like, it tastes good and it looks good in a bottle. But it took only a few dosages for patients to start experiencing renal failure. The effects of the elixir sulfonilamide drug are found to come in three stages. The first stage of diethylene glycol poisoning can cause the victim to become nauseous, vomit, diarrhea, and drowsiness. The second stage can develop in one to three days after ingestion and can cause liver and kidney damage, which can then lead to acute kidney failure and even death. And the final stage can develop within five to ten days after ingestion and can cause lethargy, facial paralysis, dysphonia, dilated and non-reactive pupils, coma, and permanent brain damage. The deaths were investigated by the American Medical Association and the University of Chicago, who determined that the diethylene glycol in the elixir was killing the patients. This information was brought to the attention of the Massengill Company, but all they did was issue a telegram recall to the doctors who had purchased the tainted elixir, failing to mention that the deaths were occurring. The FDA was alerted to these poisoning cases and went to the Massengill Company production facilities to alert the chemist producing the elixir of its toxicity. By the time the FDA got the company to stop producing the poisoned elixir, more than 100 people had died and many more hospitalized. In the aftermath of this tragedy, the FDA could only charge the Massengill Company with misbranding their product under the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. According to this act, a product labeled as an elixir must contain alcohol and the elixir sulfonilamide did not. The Massengill Company paid $26,000 in fines and absolved themselves of any wrongdoings stating that they did in good faith everything the law required them to do. Watkins, the chemist in charge of producing the elixir, committed suicide. Parents, family members, and doctors of people that died were outraged at what happened, so they wrote letters and traveled to Congress to pressure the lawmakers to act. In the wake of the tragic events from the sulfonilamide incident, Congress was forced to respond with appropriate action. The FDA needed more power to regulate these drugs so that future incidents would not occur, assuring that medicines on the market met proper safety requirements. Before these tragic events, FDA Commissioner Walter Campbell had been hard at work, fighting for stricter federal regulation of drugs. Contributing to these events, Commissioner Campbell stated, It is unfortunate that under the terms of our present inadequate federal law, the Food and Drug Administration is obliged to proceed against this product on a technical and trivial charge of misbranding. The elixir sulfonilamide incident emphasizes how essential it is to public welfare that the distribution of highly potent drugs should be controlled by an adequate federal food and drug law. An adequate federal food and drug law was what the nation was missing. Adequate measures were taken and the FDA was given the necessary control over drugs through the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Signed in on June 25, 1938, 
the new law included a various amount of products with drugs, cosmetics, medical devices, and food, all given proper definitions and legal requirements. With the new law, drugs, devices, and food must be declared safe by the FDA before entering the market. The FDA was given the power to inspect factories in order to assure this safety. The power of the FDA extends after the product has hit the shelves, as the FDA reserves the right to monitor and withdraw approval if the safety of the product has been breached. The misbranding of products was also of major concern. The FDCA requires truthful conveying of information in labeling and marketing. Failure to comply with FDCA requirements and guilty of having the intent to harm is subject to three years of prison. If the intent to harm is not clearly found, a misdemeanor account can be enacted. The Act does have its limitations, which have come up for debate. One thing the Act does allow is for physicians to prescribe drugs in ways other than what is outlined on the package, which could lead to unintended results. A drug tested for an adult can be prescribed to a child, or a drug tested for a certain disease can be prescribed by a doctor in hopes of curing diseases that the drug was not tested for. In the year 2000, the U.S. Supreme Court also moved tobacco products outside of FDA control in their decision in FDA versus Brown and Williamson Tobacco Court. The FDA claimed that nicotine is a drug and that cigarettes and smokeless tobacco are devices, given the definitions of a drug and device as outlined in the FDCA. Congress stated that if the FDA were to regulate tobacco products, this would lead to several contradictions within the already established FDCA. The FDCA was to approve safe products for market, and if tobacco products were considered devices, they would never pass qualifications. Tobacco products lack the ability to be used safely and cannot be banned due to dependence and economic factors which place them outside of FDA control. Completely excluding tobacco from FDA control was also not an option, which led to the passing of the Family Smoking Prevention and Control Act in June of 2009, which created a tobacco control center within the FDA, requires all product ingredients to be listed, must have FDA approval for any new tobacco products, it limits advertising that could attract young smokers, and extended FDA approval for the use of expressions light, mild, or low. The sulfonylamide incident led directly to the passing of the FDCA, which stands today as a primary source for the FDA to enforce safety standards among drugs, cosmetics, devices, and food. The elixir sulfonylamide incident is one of the main reasons why the FDA stepped in to regulate the safety of food and drugs. However, at the cost of over 100 lives, it is unfortunate that it took such a tragedy before legal action was taken. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 empowered the FDA to regulate drugs more closely in an attempt to prevent the reoccurrence of another tragedy.